Yesterday we heard from Sean, and his book was very uplifting, very, very positive. Um, Max's book, Invisible Man, not, not as positive, and 1984 is also not a very positive book. It does not have a happy ending. Everyone doesn't live happily ever after. It ends in misery and heartbreak. So, let's get into it. Alright, so, there's going to be five sections to my presentation. First, about the author, then some vocabulary that George Orwell created for this book, and also redefined for this book. The setting and characters. The world of 1984 is probably more important than the story or the plot. The world that he created is really what's interesting about this book. And then, of course, I'll go through the plot, and then the reception and effect of this book. It has been banned all over the world. People have hated it and fought against it, and I think that's an important part of why this book is so, uh, so life-changing for so many people. All right, so first of all, uh, George Orwell, that's not his real name. Like many authors, he uses a pen name. His real name is Eric Arthur Blair, and he only lived to be 47 years old. He was born in 1903 and died in 1950. This is just not doing anything. <laughs> um, first, his birth and early life. Like I said, he was born in 1903. He was born in India, but at this time, India was controlled by the British Empire. So he was born in kind of Britain, but in India. And then he moved to England at a very early age, and he didn't even meet his father until he was nine years old. Uh, he has two sisters, and uh, two good friends that I'll mention briefly, <laughs> Cyril and uh, Jacintha, and then he also met Aldous Huxley during his life. I don't know if you know who that is. He wrote a book called Brave New World, which is very similar to 1984 in its dystopian future themes, and they actually met in when George Orwell was in university. Uh, his love life, he had two wives and one adopted son, and I'll talk about the schools he went to. Okay. All right. Is there a point to this? Did it like time out or something? Is it off? Okay. Um, so he's born in 1903. This is the boring stuff. I'll get to the good stuff later. Born in 1903 uh, in India, moved to British at an early age, like I said. In 1911, he started boarding school, which I'm sure some of you can be very familiar with if you live in the dorms near campus. It's kind of similar to a boarding school. Uh, he met his father the next year when he lived in Oxfordshire. He went to Eton University. Uh, that's where he met <coughs> Aldous Huxley, who was one of his teachers. He studied there until he went to Burma to fight, uh, to be like a police officer and that happened in 1922. All right, so, uh, his two sisters, Marjorie and Avril, one five years older, one five years younger. Uh, he lived with Marjorie after he came back from Burma, and his younger sister, Avril, actually raised his son uh, after he passed away, because he died very young. Uh, two close friends, Jacintha and Cyril, they, uh, their big influences on it, they helped published some of his first works, and they're both writers, and they uh, they helped each other in their adoption of a new point of view. And Aldous Huxley, his teacher, he taught French, but he Orwell credits him as a big inspiration for his book for 1984. Like, so I'm just going to point at you. <laughs> uh, so this is his first wife, Eileen. Um, they were not what you would consider a perfect marriage. They both admitted to infidelity and cheating on each other. They were unable to have biological children together, and they eventually adopted. Um, so she had a kind of a rough life, too. She, her brother died in World War II fighting in France, and I think her job, she worked at the Department of the Ministry of Information, the Censorship Department, in the Ministry of Information. And that department actually plays a big role in 1984, because there's a lot of censorship in 1984. That's one of the biggest themes about it. All right. This is his second wife. His first wife died. 
Um, and he remarried just like one year before his death. Um, some people say that Sonia is the inspiration for the love interest in 1984. Uh, there's a lot of parallels between her life and the, the love story in the book. So she's kind of important even though they only knew each other for a short time. And his education, he went to convent school when he was five years old, Roman Catholic convent school uh, that was run by nuns because his family couldn't afford, back at that time, public education was more expensive. So they couldn't afford that, so he went to this uh, Catholic school. And then he went to St. Cyprian's, which is another religious school, um, where he began <coughs> writing and he started publishing and falling into his uh, passion there. And eventually Eaton University, where he met Aldous Huxley. He said he was happy enough there. He didn't really like school very much, but at university he kind of uh, found out who he was and was a happier person. All right, that's the boring stuff. Now, vocabulary. So, like I said, he created a lot of words for this book. Don't worry, there's not going to be a vocab test. I just think it's really interesting, the words that he uses, and it's a big part of, uh, of the book. So, first, these are vocab words that he created for the book. First, there is thought crime. Uh, this is the concept of you can break the law by thinking bad things. It's not about action. In the world of 1984, it is illegal to have bad thoughts. And there are cameras everywhere recording your facial expressions, and they would arrest you if they think that you are thinking something against the law. Wow. Yeah, so this, it's called a dystopian future, and that, that means a future that has gotten worse instead of better. A future where uh, we're not living in paradise, we haven't created the perfect society, it's gone the opposite direction, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. The next word is doublethink. This is the ability to accept mutually contradicting beliefs. Uh, it is to, to accept the fact that we had more water than yesterday because we only have one bottle instead of two. Yesterday we had two bottles, today we have one bottle of water, that means we have more water today. It's not true, right? It's double think. It is accepting a truth that is not reality. We have duck speak. This is quacking like a duck. This is just saying what the government tells you to say without thinking about it. You're not actually being interrogative. You're just repeating what you're told to repeat without thought. And then there's an unperson. This is a person who has been deleted from society. Like I said, there's a lot of censorship they will literally censor an entire person. They will kill you and delete you from history, and you become an unperson. And then the last word is black-white. This is similar to doublethink. It is knowing that black is white. Knowing that two things in complete contradiction of each other are both true, which is impossible, but that's the whole concept of the book. All right. Then he redefined some words as well. The first word that he redefined was free. There's no such thing as free in regards to freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. It's purely like free from danger, as in you're not in danger. It's not about your personal freedoms, it's about uh, the government's control. Also equal. Equal is not talking about the equality of men and women, or different races, or sexual orientations, or whatever. It's purely these two piles have an equal number of apples. It's not, it's not a social concept. It's like a counting thing. Uh, good. Good doesn't mean you like it. Good doesn't mean it's favorable to you. Good just means it agrees with the government. And they've also eliminated all of these wonderful adjectives that we use. Instead of great or amazing or wonderful, it's good plus good, double plus good. There's no real expression or thought. And then misprints. Something that's a misprint we know of as a mistake, right? But in George Orwell's world of 1984, a misprint is something that doesn't agree with the party, that goes against the party's viewpoint, the government's viewpoint. So the setting, location, background information, characters. 
think this, like I said, the setting is probably more important than the plot of this book. Uh, so George, or, uh, Winston, our main character, lives in Oceania. The national language is Newspeak. The ideology is Ingsoc. That's their party's philosophy. Uh, there's four ministries that are controlling the government. The Ministry of Peace. What do you think they do? They conduct war, of course. The Ministry of Peace conducts the wars. Uh, the Ministry of Penty, Plenty rations the food, and there's huge food shortages and, and power shortages. The Ministry of Plenty is the one that controls them. The Ministry of Truth, anyone guess? What does the Ministry of Truth do? <coughs> Creates lies for the party, right? And then the Ministry of Love, they're the police. They're the ones who arrest people and kill them and take them to jail. So we have uh, three totalitarian super states. We have Oceania, we have Eurasia, and we have East Asia. Um, Oceania is like North and South America and England. Eurasia is Europe except for England and like Russia and uh, like Eastern, e Eastern uh, Europe. And then East Asia is like China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, Australia. Um, and they're in a constant state of war. They control the people in the countries by fear and by propaganda. And they're always at war. There is never a time when these countries aren't at war with each other. And who they're at war with can change daily. It's not really important. They're not, there's not a lot of active combat going on. It's purely a tool to control the people living there and censorship and surveillance. Photographs, novels, textbooks, data, famous people, everything else, heavily censored. And it's not just censored, but outright lies. It's often just changed to lies. Uh, every home, every apartment, every outdoor space, they have something called a telescreen. This is like CCTV, but it also has like a, a video monitor on it. And you are constantly being monitored in everything you do, everywhere you go, everything you say, everyone you talk to is being monitored by the government. So, our characters. We have Winston Smith, he's our protagonist, he's our lead. Um, he works at the Ministry of Truth. His job is editing history books to agree with the party. So they'll say they're at war with East Asia, and then next week, They'll change it to be at war with Eurasia. And it's his job to go through the history books and say, oh, we've always been at war with Eurasia. We were never at war with East Asia. That never happened. So it's his job to create these lies for the party. Uh, Julia, his love interest. She also works at the Ministry of Truth. That's where they meet. She's kind of the rebel figure. She encourages Winston to fight back against the party. We have O'Brien. He is their boss at the Ministry of Truth. He is a member of the inner party, so he is a very high-ranking member of the government. And they trust him for a short period of time until he betrays them and is the cause of their eventual downfall. And then Big Brother. Big Brother's not really a character, but it's also the most important character in the book. Big Brother is the idea of control. Um, it's kind of referred to as a president type figure, but you never meet this person, they never say anything, all of their communication is through other channels, and it's purely the idea of control and subversion for the people that are living there. So, the plot, 1984. We can see the, the CCTV cameras, right? That's a big part of the plot. Uh, so, I think it's important to remember this book was written 35 years into the future. We think of the year 1984 as in the past, almost 35 years into the past, but when it was written, that was 35 years into the future. So that would be like writing a book today called 2055. It's, it's talking about the future, not the past, when it was written. So Winston Smith works at the Ministry of Truth. He rewrites history of the world to conform with the party. Uh, which, of course, is constantly changing depending on what Big Brother wants that day. He dreams of rebellion and overthrowing the party, which, of course, means he is a thought criminal. 
He has committed thought crimes. He hasn't done anything wrong, but he doesn't agree with the party, which means he's a criminal. Uh, he meets a woman named Julia at his workplace, and he's infatuated by her, but of course he's afraid of saying anything, because relationships are illegal in this world, unless they're for the sole purpose of procreation. Creating children is the only reason to be in a relationship in this world. Love is forbidden. And he falls in love with her. But luckily for him, she hands him a note one day that says, I love you. Which of course is a thought crime on her part as well. So she takes the first step. She's more brave than he is. Um, and they start an affair in secret. Um, and they have to be in secret because he's married and love is illegal. So, the next, the, the rising action here, rebellion, they start fighting back against the party, right? They fall in love, they share their mutual hatred of Big Brother and their hatred of the party. Yeah, there's this antique shop that they go to frequently that, I mean, art and novels and self-expression don't really exist in this world, so this antique shop is kind of one of the only places where you can see creativity that exists. And there's a hotel above the antique shop. So Winston and Julia use that to carry out their affair. Um, O'Brien, who is their boss, he actually approaches Winston and Julia disguised as a member of the rebellion, trying to say, hey, we're looking for people to fight back against the party. We're looking for people who want to uh, take out Big Brother and create a better world. Their boss approaches them with this proposition. And so of course they're very interested in it. That's something that they want, they're both doing that already. So when he approaches them, they, they join up with him. But of course they're betrayed. Uh, Mr. Sherrington, the guy who works at the antique shop, he is a member of the Thought Police, and he arrests them. O'Brien, their, uh, their boss, who they tried to start a rebellion with, is also a member of the Thought Police and carries out their eventual torture and breakdown of their psychology. Uh, he betrays them and forces them to submit to the party. So they begin brainwashing them. You must believe everything the party says. The doublespeak, the, uh, the black-white. If the party says two plus two equals five, you have to agree. You have to say yes. Two plus two equals five. Of course, I know that. I've always known that. That's the will of the party. You're not allowed to have any sort of free thought. And then, submission. This is the most tragic part of the book. They lose. They're trying to fight back against this oligarchical power that controls them and is evil in every aspect, is full of lies and deceit and control, and they fight back and they eventually lose. They submit to the party. They tell each other, they, event, they were both tortured, eventually they're released from torture, and they tell each other about their torture. While they were tortured, they were forced to say, um, please make this torture happen to Julia or Winston instead of myself. They betrayed the only person that they loved. And that caused them to fall out of love with each other. The, the big brother and the party, they destroyed the love that these two people had for each other. And the last four words of the book, I think, are the most depressing four words of existence. He loved big brother. So it's not just that they submitted to the party. It's not just that they were willing to say, yes, two plus two equals five, yes, black equals white. No, they actually believed it. They felt it. They lost their free will and their humanity. And the last four words of the book are, he loved Big Brother. He became a member of this thought police submission group. Pretty depressing. <laughs> so, my opinions of the book. So, obedience is not a virtue. I think that's one of the main themes of this book. Just because someone has more power than you, more money than you, more control than you, they're older than you, that does not mean that you should submit to their will. We should be our own persons. We should look for our individuality. 
Power is not automatically righteous. Authority is not automatically moral. And crime is not automatically wrong. Society constantly changes. We have to strive for a better society. My text color was really bad. I should have chosen a darker text. This is almost unreadable. Uh, in the past, <coughs> owning slaves, that was legal. Was it moral? No. Beating your wife was legal. Even today, women walking alone in Saudi Arabia, this is illegal. In Korea, having an artist give you a tattoo or buying food from a street vendor, this is illegal. Should it be? Is it immoral? Is it wrong? Should we agree with these things simply because they're law? I think we should have our own opinions and we should fight for what we think is right, not just submit to someone who has more power than us. So, every day we make decisions about what rules to follow and what rules to break. Who among us has never crossed a road outside of a crosswalk or when there's not a green light? Raise your hand if you've never done that. Exactly, you've all broken the law, right? <laughs> That's illegal. We've all broken the law. So, who's connected to an unsecured Wi-Fi network? Who has connected their phone or their computer to an unsecured Wi-Fi network? Everyone, right? That's illegal, technically. It's, it's against the law. It's your, uh, your putting someone else's data at risk. You're not allowed to do that. Who's ridden in a car without a seatbelt? Right? We, we make these decisions every day of what laws to follow, of what we think is moral, of what we should do. I think we should expand our view of these ideas. We're totally willing to, to connect to an unsecured Wi-Fi network or cross the street if there's no cars coming. Why are we willing to break those laws and not look deeper into the laws and morals of our society? and actually question them and ask, are these laws just or should we fight against them or break them? Nazis, Maoists, members of the Khmer Rouge party, they all killed millions of people throughout history. And they all did it legally. They all did it with the support and the backing of their governments. Uh, just because someone is older than you, has a higher rank than you, makes more money than you, does not mean they're a better person than you, and does not mean they're more knowledgeable than you. Don't let immoral people take and use power against you. I think that's the main theme of this book. Don't let people who are immoral have control over your life. So, reception. This is one of the most banned books in history, and I think you can start to understand why, because it really feeds into the rebel against the power mindset. So people in power don't want you to read this book because it teaches you that they maybe shouldn't have power. Uh, in 1950, it was banned in Russia. Owning this book would mean you were arrested in Russia at this time. Even today, or back then, they publicly held book burnings. Uh, it's a banned search in China, possibly because of... Uh, Nanking, which happened the same year, but you're not allowed to search the year 1984 in China. It's a banned search term. Um, also, George Orwell's other book, Animal Farm, a big critique on communism, another very controversial book, is also banned in a lot of places. Uh, even schools in the U.S. have tried and succeeded in banning it as recently as 2017. Yeah. Schools in Florida... Uh, recently tried to get this book banned in 2017. So it's something that is still controversial to this day, despite being 70 years old, and people are still trying to suppress the message that it wants to send. Uh, it's won awards, along with Animal Farm. Both of them have won numerous literary awards for their quality and their writing style. They're both very famous books around the world. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening.